Amen. Thank you so much, big cousin, Reverend Stanley. It's good to be on tonight, Expectation Moments, 1713. Um, uh, somebody asked me, I got, I always tell y'all some funny stories. Somebody asked me, you know, how long y'all gonna do this? And I said, we're gonna do it to Jesus come back. So what, I, what, what we're gonna do is keep doing this and Jesus gonna catch us having Bible study when he come back. That's how long we're gonna do it. So we're not gonna stop a minute before that. I, again, can't stress enough how grateful I am for all of you who have been so faithful that we have been able to do this every night. Not one night have we got on here. Wasn't nobody on here. Uh-oh, I'm muted on my phone, okay? Not one night have we gotten on our um, expectation moment. Wasn't nobody here. So on behalf of the ministers of St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church, we're grateful for you and your faithfulness. And I'm grateful to the faithfulness of all the ministers who continue to carry the, the baton. Last week, a couple of weeks ago, we were watching the Olympics and one guy was running Reverend Stanley and the other guy wasn't ready when it was his time. And they, they fumbled the... They fumbled the handoff and got disqualified. But I thank God for a group of preachers that we keep handing this off and we keep running. And not one time when we dropped it, we ain't had to get disqualified. We still running to see what the end going to be for Deacon Edwards. We still running on to see what the end going to be. So I thank God for you, all of us, minister. But I thank God for his, his, his instruction. I thank God for his direction. I thank God for this call to us because I truly believe that it has strengthened each of us. And now as we live in the strength that God has given us, we'll continue to experience the closest we hit with desire with God, the power of God, the ability to praise and worship God, the ability to serve God, and the peace and the joy that God has made available to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. These last several days we have been here and we have been studying on what God has for you is for you. We have seen a few things. We've been in Philippians 4, 19. We've been in um, Matthew 6 and 33. We've been in Genesis 22. Uh, and last night we studied this as well, 2 Corinthians 9. And what we have brought out of that, what we've um, derived, what we've gotten for application to our lives, first of all, is in order to get what God has for you, we must first seek God first. That's what Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then it says, and all these things we added to you. All that we need, God will give us as we seek him. That's number one. In, in Philippians 4, uh, we are very aware that Paul, as he spoke to the church at Philippi, um, he told them, I appreciate what you've given me. He said, but I also want you to know that what matters most to me is not what you give me, but more importantly, what I give you. That's the, 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 the posture each of us that should have as Christians. Paul said, what, me serving you and me sharing Christ with you and me teaching you that you may grow in Christ is really fruit added to my account. He said, that's what I'm looking for. And when we change our mindset and we look to serve God and look to bear fruit in our lives because others, listen to this, because others come to know God and know Jesus Christ as their Savior, guess fruit. And as a result of that, the next verse Paul says, my God shall supply all your needs. Paul said, if you do that, my God shall supply all your needs according to him in glory in Christ, all his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And Paul was saying it, uh, not it was just his God, but he was saying that I know my God. And he wants us to, I want you to know my God. It's our God that we will know that as we serve him, he will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Then we understand, looking at Genesis, when Abraham was faced with the dilemma, Abraham's belief caused him to receive. And the Lord just showed me this, caused him to receive the provision he needed at the time he needed. What God had for him was for him, but he would never have gotten it had he not believed and trusted God. Getting what God has for us means we have to believe it. Let me just say this. Sometimes in our carnal minds, our fleshly minds, uh, we forget who God is. We're going to get to that tonight. And when we forget who God is, we understand we miss out on the fact that God will provide. And so when you know that God is faithful and just, when you know that despite whatever weakness we have, God will do what only God can do. We'll get a chance to see God's provision, even in times of extremists, in times of crisis. Last night in the book of um, 2 Corinthians, Paul told us something you got to do. If you want to get out and get what God has for you, you got to be willing to give. Um, sometimes I said this before, some of us have looked at our accounts and said, I can't afford to give. I say again, we can't afford not to give because it's by how we, and it's not that we give to God. It's, like, it's not a Ponzi scheme with God. We're giving to God saying, God, I trust you in my finances. And God in return, as Second, second uh, Corinthians says, no, God would bless us abundantly, uh, abundantly. And I, like, I love the word that Paul used. God will bless us out of his abundance. And when God bless us out of his abundance, what we, he, he said is like this, God is able to make all grace, all of his unmerited favor bound toward us, that we may have everything we need all the time and that we may equip to do every good work. That's a clear word from God. When we when we give as God has given us, giving our hearts with cheerfulness and thanksgiving, what God is going to do is make his grace abound toward us. I said it last night. I can't help but say it again. 
How many of us have, have seen in our lives that we've given to God, that God will make the car last longer, make the month last longer if you need to pay a bill, give you more time than you could have imagined, keep the hot water heater from going out, keep the air conditioning working in the day of the summer, or if it breaks, it ain't cost but a, it don't cost but a little bit to get it fixed. That's what God's grace toward us means, but it also means that God changes our hearts. No longer do we covet stuff, no longer we greedy, but when we give to God, it opens up our hearts so we're just content to know that God's got it covered. Tonight then, Having said all that, we're in the book of James chapter 1. James chapter 1 reminds us that the source of all that we need, the source of all that we desire, is not from this world. It is not worldly. It is not from somebody. It is from the Lord. I was trying to order something today, and I wanted to get it here as soon as I can, so I could. So I, I went on Amazon. So, you know, you know Amazon, got Amazon truck is delivered all night long. Amazon didn't have it. I went somewhere else. And said, so maybe I can pick it up from here. They said, we got it, but it's not in stock. Uh, you can't, can't get it from Atlanta. And I kept looking. I, I said, fine, I ain't going to be able to get what I want. And right about that time, the Lord reminded me this right here. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variable, neither shadow or turning. In other words, Target, Walmart, and Amazon can't give you nothing. But what we know that we can get everything we need from God. We'll never ask God. And God said, that blessing is not in stock. We'll never come to God and God will say, well, not right now. I'm going to have to have it shipped to you in three to five business days. Everything we need is from God. And the beauty of that is that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Let me just talk about this verse for a minute. I ain't going to hold y'all all night. In James chapter one, what we see is that James, the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he wrote this letter uh, to, to pre prepare and to protect the believer in times of trial and tribulation. He wrote it so that the believer, us, we would know how to act and how to respond. In James chapter one, he lets us know that how we ought to behave, what our mindset ought to be in terms of trial and tribulation. Verse two uh, 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 encapsulates, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when we fall into the of temptation. He said, don't count it as something to be sad about, but count it all joy because we know that this trying of our faith gives us patience. It works patience and this patience will have a perfect work and then finally, that we may um, that we may have um, that we may grow and be perfect and tired in our lives, wanting nothing. That's it. That's what he says. That's our mindset. The mindset of a Christian ought to be just like that. When trouble comes, we don't give up. Instead, we praise God, knowing there's some some good work. God is working stuff out of us. In verse five, he gives us this understanding that when we lack something, we don't have to try to figure out what we're gonna get it, especially as it relates to the wisdom of God. And let me pause and say this. The wisdom of God is incredibly important because the wisdom of God, wisdom in our lives is important because wisdom allows us to understand how to live according to God's word, how to apply what we know to our lives. Wisdom is, 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 is more important than just knowledge and understanding. You can know something, but you can't do nothing with it. You can understand something, but if you don't know how to apply it, nothing will happen. He says, if you at, 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 lack wisdom, don't despair. All you got to do is ask God and God will give to everybody wisdom liberally, liberally it means that god won't mess with you and pick on you about it but he shall give it to us freely let me see if i can put that in context let's say for example one of my sons comes to me and said daddy you know um i, I messed up and i want to know what i should do what you do so uh, daddy i didn't put no oil in the car and when i tried to start this it made this loud noise what should i do now as a father i'm mad because i know he done thrown a rod but god when we throw a rod in our spiritual lives guess what God does not upbraid us. He instead goes back and tells us just what you need to do the next time. Well, this is how you need to live. Well, that actually happened to me. Uh, they threw a rod in the front yard, and I had to tell them after I finished fussing, the next time when they say put oil in, put oil in. But what God would do when it says he won't upbraid us, God will give us wisdom without chastising us, not fussing at us. He'll give us wisdom that we can apply it so that we can live better in our lives. He keeps going. Uh, he wants us to understand that it's important for us not to sway between Christianity and the world. He makes it plain that he doesn't want us to, to be a pendulum people, a pendulum people, whatever wind is blowing, we go the way of the wind. God wants us to be a people who don't um, are not double-minded because a double-minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. He wants us to understand that it is through Christ that all of us are equal and that God, by his power, can lift up the person that is low and bring down the person that's high so that we can live in a space where we can fully appreciate God. I'm almost to the text now. In verse 11, he lets us know 
that the things of the world are, will, will come and go. Riches will come and go. We know that. He lets us know. I was reading an article today, Reverend Stanley, where it said this billionaire, and he was worth $50 billion. The next day, he was worth $25 billion. Now, he, now, that's still a lot of money. But think about how quick, how he felt losing half of his wealth. Money, no care who got it, will can come and money can go. He said, the sun is no sooner risen with the burning heat that the grass withers. And that is the way of the rich. Um, verse 12, he says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. Now, now we get getting to where we're going. Blessed is the man. Happy is the man. Satisfied is the person that endures temptation, that doesn't give up, that doesn't give in, that keeps pressing on, trusting in God. Why? For when that person is tried, when that person comes to the day of judgment, the Bible says he shall receive the crown of life. When we're going through trials and tribulations, God is telling us you're blessed if you just hold on. You're blessed if you endure these, these trials and tribulations because the day will come when we stand before the Lord and we receive the crown of life. How do we know we're going to get it? Because the Lord promised the crown of life to all those that love him. Now, look at this. When we endure temptation, that means we don't fall to it, but we trust God in it. That indicates how much we really love God. And therefore, we receive the crown of life because we demonstrated how much we love God. And therefore, God has promised a crown of life to those who love him. Verse 13 says, let no man say, this is important for this text now. Let no man say when he's tempted, God tempted me. Because why? Because God won't tempt us. He cannot tempt us with evil. He's good. You know, evil ain't no evil in God. So God won't tempt us. Neither can we say it, um, that God tempted anybody because God won't tempt nobody. Verse 14 says, but every man is tempted. Every man is tempted. All of us have temptations when he is drawn away of his own lust. What causes us to, be, to, to fall to temptation? It ain't God. And a lot of times we blame it on Satan. It's our lust. It's our flesh that causes us to fall to temptation. And it's an enticement of the flesh that causes us to leave where God is wants us to be and go where we want to go. Verse 15, he says, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. That's what, in other words, the sin comes when we in, when we can think about it. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. So it's a, it's an equation. Think about sin, you move to do it, and then it brings about death. Now, verse 16, he says, don't err, my beloved brother. He says, be clear. That's what he's saying. Be clear. Don't make this mistake. He says, I want you to understand this right here. Every good gift, First of all, every good gift. When God gives something, it's a good gift. Think about that. Everything that God gives is a good gift. And 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 because God can't give a bad gift. God's only giving good gifts. And then he also said every perfect gift. A perfect gift is a is a complete gift. It is not only something that's kind of good for us, it's completely good for us. So God is giving good gifts that are good to us, but God is also, the Lord just showed me this, giving us good gifts that are good for us. It's it's God to give a gift that we like. But God will give us a gift that's good for us. It is a good gift. Uh, it, it is not just something we like on a on a uh, intrinsic basis, but it's something that's good for us on a spiritual basis. When God gives something, somebody says, "Well, if I could just hit the lottery, I'd make it." Sometimes God, as a matter of fact, very few people hit the lottery because if we hit the lottery, it would some always be good for us. We might have a lot of money for a minute, but sometimes that will cause us to trust what we what the, the lottery is opposed to trusting God. Every gift God is, gives is a good gift. It is perfect in that it is good for us. Where does it come from, James? It's from above. These gifts come from God. They're from above. I like the concept because if you look at uh, 1 Peter 1 and Ephesians 1, it lets us, in Ephesians 1, it lets us know that God has all of, all of our spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Some of them, those spiritual blessings manifest themselves in physical material ways, but they're, they're, they're I'm sorry, we have every good a spiritual gift that comes to us. But as we have these spiritual gifts, it qualifies us, I should say, for the material things that God gives us. So when we understand that gifts come from God, we understand then that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift, that these gifts are good to us and also give good for us. Now watch this. He said, they come from above. And he said, it's as if to clarify, James said, it coming down from the Father of lights. Let me pause here. The Father of lights is, 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 is painting a picture of God being the creator and sustainer of all celestial heavenly bodies. The, a couple of nights ago, the moon was blue. Why? Because there was another um, um, star that shined that created the blue hue of the sun. Last night, the moon was like we could reach out and touch it if you looked outside. Why? Because the moon itself uh, it was is clear. It, it's God controls it. Let me just say this. God doesn't change. And because God is the father of lights, we think the stars move. The stars don't move. We're moving. The earth is moving. 
when I was a little boy, I used to think the sun was was moving. It's actually not the sun moving. The earth is moving. And so therefore, we understand the, the concept. It's when we don't get what God wants for us, it ain't the God move. It's just that we move from where God wants us to be. That is imperative for us as Christians to understand. The sun does rise in the east and set in the west. It does. And nothing can change that because it is God's movement of the celestial bodies. When James said that God is the father of lights, he means God is the father that controls everything, everything bright. Everything that creates and has any light, that came from God. Now, why do you think James said that? Well, it's revealed in this next clause. Neither shadow, no, with, it, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow or turning. Two things. Because God gives every good and perfect gift, because we can count on his gifts being good, because he's a father of lights, he also wants to make the differentiation that God doesn't change. How many of us have had somebody that's been kind to us and turned around and was mean to us? How many of us have ever had somebody gave you and turned around and took from you? How many of us have ever had, I had a room, a friend of mine, somebody wrote him a $500 check because they had done some work for him and the person got mad at him and had, what's it called when you stop payment? Stop payment on the check before he got it. He gave it and took it away. When I was little, we used to call that an Indian giver. God is not an Indian giver. God would give us good and perfect gifts. What God has for us is for us. He's going to give it to us. He's not going to take it away. Why? Because there's no shadow or turning in him. God is the God of lights. He's a giver of every good and perfect gift. And because he is who he is, he would never take away anything from us and not even pull back what he's given us. Why? Because he's not a changing God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so as I say that, I want to dismiss us by and close by saying this. We can be faithful and trust God completely because we know that what God has for us, he is going to give it to us. And it's ours because he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. If you sometimes wonder, well, am I going to get what I need? Understand that God has it for you. And you don't have to wonder, does he have? Because he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. And you don't have to worry about his God taking it away um, because God is not a variable. He doesn't change. And, and more importantly than that, he is not a shadow of turning. He's not going to ever change his mind because he's God and doesn't change. I want us to be convinced and convicted and confident and comfortable in who God is and never wonder do we need to try to get something from the world because the world doesn't have anything that we need. God is to give a very good and perfect gift. Even if God chooses to give it to us through some other method, God is the source of every good and perfect gift. Therefore, let us trust completely in him. I'm going to stop and let y'all go tonight at about 723. I'm grateful for one more night of living in expectation. I pray that we will rest tonight and just trust God and do what God has called us to do, that we may experience his provision, his power, his protection, his direction, and, our, and his peace in our lives. God bless you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we got to tell you how much we love you, God, because you have truly been good to us. We thank you, God, and we praise you, God, for all of your blessings. And I pray, God, now as we hang up our phone lines and pack up our Zooms and, I mean, our MacBooks, iPads, uh, tablets, and computers, let us be rest assured, Lord, that you are totally in control and that we can rest assured that what you have for us is for us, that nobody can take it and you won't change. We love you, and I pray, God, you bless every household, every family, and every individual believer tonight as we trust in you. We love you. God, we thank you. We praise you. We pray, God, this week that you would just grant, grant us a praying spirit, a praying heart, a praying mind that we can experience, Lord, all you have for us. Bless us today and bless us this weekend comes. In Jesus' name, prepare us to receive those who you send on Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, St. Peter.